May 2018, the then President of the United States of America, Donald Trump, shelved the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, the joint nuclear deal with Iran, and reimposed economic sanctions on the Ayatollah regime. The rest of the countries that had signed the agreement, and the European itself, wanted to keep it alive. But on this point, the Trump administration was inflexible, and its decision left no room for action. It was a turning point. Overnight, the sanctions put an end to the main conditions imposed on Iran in the nuclear pact. The possibility of attracting investment and reactivating its crude oil exports. So Iran went back on the attack, failing to comply with several of its promises. And let's be clear, if there is one country in the world that watches the nuclear advances of the Islamic Republic of Iran day and night, it is Israel. In fact, today, thanks to its reconciliation with the Arab powers, the only real threat to Israel's existence comes from Iran, and more specifically, from from its nuclear weapons program. So could Iran really develop the nuclear bomb? What is the new Biden administration doing? And perhaps the most important question of all, what on earth is Israel doing? Today on Visual Politic, we're going to answer all of these questions. Listen up. A covert war? If there is one thing the Israeli government is clear about, it is that it is far better to strike first before the enemy strikes you, especially when your very existence may be at risk. So the Israeli state's security motto is basically to confront threats directly. This is an idea that took shape just 40 years ago, when the Prime Minister Menachem Begin decided to attack Iraq's nuclear reactor in Osirak. It was the beginning of the so-called Begin Doctrine. Listen up. Israel has nothing to apologize for. We decided to act now, before it is too late, that we shall defend our people with all the means at our disposal. With the Begin Doctrine, Israel announced to the world that it reserves the right to launch preemptive strikes against any enemy attempting to develop weapons of mass destruction. For example, the 1981 attack on Iraq's significantly delayed Saddam Hussein's nuclear weapons program. But this was not an isolated case. Another example occurred in 2007, when Israel attacked the construction of a nuclear reactor in Syria to prevent the Al-Assad regime from advancing in the manufacture of plutonium bombs. But let's stop for a moment and go back to Iran. The Iranian nuclear program has always been opposed by the main Western powers, despite Tehran's assurances that its purposes are peaceful, that the program is strictly for energy purposes. Of course, this is something that the West has always questioned, not least because of the Iranian regime's accumulation of thousands of centrifuges, the machines used to enrich uranium. In response, the United States and the European Union have been punishing Iran for years through economic sanctions, sanctions that were intended to dissuade Iran from continuing its nuclear program. But we have already told you that Today, the only existential threat to Israel is precisely the Iran of the Ayatollahs. And what is clear is that they were never going to stand idly by. Well, with its Begin Doctrine, the Hebrew state has chosen to combat this program by means of covert operations. And for this purpose, it has turned to its intelligence agency, the famous Mossad. So what kind of operations are we talking about? Well, we are talking about classic spy operations, along with more modern ones, such as Operation Olympic Games, the first major cyber weapons attack in history. And look at this this. At the beginning of this century, Iran was using centrifuges based on a design stolen from a Dutch company. For this reason, the Mossad and the CIA conducted the Dutch intelligence agency to infiltrate the Iranian nuclear plant in Natanz by the way of a mole. The Dutch recruited an Iranian engineer who implanted Stuxnet in Natanz computer systems. We're talking about a virus controlled by Israeli and American spies which ordered the Natanz centrifuges to spin out of control. An estimated 1,000 centrifuges were put out of service. 20% of all all the centrifuges located at the plant. The Stuxnet virus was not detected until June 2010. Perhaps most surprising of all, Mossad is demonstrating an uncanny ability to maneuver on Iranian soil. Without looking too far, in 2018, Israeli spies stole a massive amount of documents to prove to the world that Iran's nuclear program was still ongoing. And that gave Trump the perfect excuse to suspend the Iran deal. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu personally presented the documents on television. Check it out. A key part of the plan was to form new organizations to continue the work. This is how Dr. Mohsen Fahri Zadeh, head of Project Ahmad, put it. Remember that name, Fahri Zadeh. Are you paying attention to Bibi? Well, it's clear that the Mossad was too. 
Mozen Fakhrizadeh, Iran's top nuclear scientist, assassinated near Tehran, BBC. Being a nuclear scientist in Iran has become a risky profession. There are already five Iranian scientists who have been literally riddled with bullets in recent years. And we're not talking about minor charges. Fakhrizadeh was the mastermind of the Ahmad project. We're talking about a character who has been engaged in the clandestine search for nuclear weapons, technology and equipment for decades. In fact, after Iran's leaders appeared to have halted their nuclear program, Fakhrizadeh secretly continued to research how to develop the atomic bomb. Mossad claims that 70% of the Ahmad project continued its work with a new organization. And yes, perhaps the loss of Fakhriza Day was more symbolic than effective, since there are dozens of scientists working as a team behind Project Ahmad. But it was a clear sign of Israel's determination to prevent this program from coming to fruition. In the last year, Iran's nuclear program has suffered numerous cyber attacks and acts of sabotage. Facilities that, with no explanation, have had all kinds of problems. Fires, explosions, or power outages. Too many coincidences that together contribute to slowing down the progress of Iran's nuclear program. So who is responsible for all these incidents? Well, Israel usually gives the Glomar response when asked about these matters. In other words, Israel simply neither confirms nor denies its involvement in these activities. Of course, the one person who has no doubts is Mohammed Javad Zarif, Iran's foreign minister. Check it out. Terrorists murdered an eminent Iranian scientist today. This cowardice with serious indications of Israeli rule shows desperate warmongering of perpetrators. Mohammed Javad Zarif, Iran's foreign minister. But before I continue, I'd like to tell you something. you know, Visual Politics' mission is to let you know the events that explain the news, what is hidden behind the big headlines, and you are a fundamental part of our being able to continue growing and improving, just being there week after week, on the other side of the screen, and also for the help that many of you give us on Patreon. That's why, in addition to the exclusive content for patrons that we already have in place, such as our weekly snapshot, or the extra videos, we will also launch surveys and periodic questionnaires, in which, for example, you could choose topics for future videos, or send us your questions. We have also prepared exclusive products that will never be available for sale. They are designs exclusive for Patreon. So if you want to be part of Visual Politic, you can do it by joining our Patreon team. We'll leave a link below where you can find more information. And with that said, let's get back into today's video. So why did Israel move to action in such a determined way? What are they doing in Iran so that the stories of Mossad make James Bond look like Maxwell Smart? Well, listen up. Back to the future. During the month of April, National Nuclear Technology Day is celebrated in Iran. Many of you probably imagine that the Ayatollah regime uses it to show off its power and frighten its enemies. And yes, Iran has taken advantage of this holiday to make propaganda videos. Videos as strange as this one. <laughs> Well, now you know why Israel has won the Eurovision Song Contest four times, and Iran is not allowed to participate. For those of us watching outside of Europe, the Eurovision Song Contest is a huge deal that started in the 50s. It's something like a cross between a soccer tournament and an idol reality show, in which every country is represented by one song and competes to get the most votes. It may also include unicycles, pirate costumes, and turkey puppets. Joking aside, the truth is that Israel has decided to take action because Iran is using these centrifuges for more than just edgy locations for its music videos. Since the United States left the nuclear pact, Iran has gone far beyond the limits set. For example, it has exceeded the limits on its heavy water reserves and on uranium stockpile. In fact, in February 2021, the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, found that Iran's stockpile of enriched uranium was 14 times greater than the established limits. In addition, Iran is also using more centrifuges than allowed and with more advanced technology, which logically serves to shorten the time span needed to enrich uranium. More importantly, Iran has been progressively increasing uranium enrichment above the permitted threshold of 3.67% purity. First, it increased to 4.5%, then to 20%. And yes, this was still far from the 90% level at which uranium becomes weapons grade. But hold on a minute, because in April, all the alarm bells went off when we saw news stories like this. Iran starts enriching uranium to 
60%, its highest level ever. AP News. Enriched uranium can be converted into uranium metal for use in weapons. In fact, Iran has indicated that it could build a new uranium metal plant, which would provide it with the material needed to manufacture the core of the atomic bomb. And yes, making such a weapon work is also a major challenge. But in any case, what seems clear is that Iran is now closer than it ever has been to creating a nuclear weapon. In fact, some experts estimate that, with no disruptions, Iran would be able to explode a test device in nine months, build a basic nuclear weapon in a year, and place a nuclear warhead on a ballistic missile in two. Despite this, there are those who believe that there is still time to recover the 2015 nuclear pact, including the current occupant of the White House. We are, though nonetheless, pleased that Iran has continued to agree to engage in discussions, in direct discussions with us and with our, our, our partners on how we move forward and what is needed to allow us to move back into the JOPCA so that we're part of it again, that we should have never gotten out of, in my view. President Biden is determined that the United States should return to the Iran nuclear deal, although it is not clear at this point that it would be effective. But of course, we have to remember that a few years ago, when he was Obama's vice president, Biden went all out to prevent the US Congress from blocking the deal. And with his foreign policy team, it's virtually the same story. Perhaps that is why, in order to get Iran to agree to respect the established limits again, they have to set to work to resume contacts between all parties. The problem is that Iran is playing its cards very well. On the one hand, Iran demands that the United States lifts all economic sanctions imposed by Trump. And on the other, it knows how to put pressure on negotiations. Take a look. Iran links UN nuclear access to progress on talks. China Daily. In recent months, Iran has made it difficult for UN inspectors to access its nuclear facilities. And you were already witnessing that Tehran links the inspections to the success of the negotiations. Then again, be careful not to tighten the noose too much with Washington, because both Israel and Saudi Arabia would be delighted if Biden were to drop the negotiations altogether. Of course, at this point, the question we can ask ourselves is, how will events unfold and what can we expect? An agreement with the room for improvement. Let's see, whoever says that Donald Trump didn't have a plan is wrong. Whether that plan was good or bad is a different matter, but all of his decisions had a purpose. In this case, by abandoning the nuclear pact, Trump sought to pressure the Ayatollah regime with sanctions, and he succeeded. Iran's economy is in a deep recession, one that is further aggravated by the pandemic. So while Biden may believe that the US should never have abandoned the pact, what he is surely aware of is that he has been presented with a second chance to renegotiate with Iran on some aspects of the deal, if only to buy time. The nuclear pact left three loose ends. The most important one refers to its sunset clauses, the limits that disappear with the passage of time. For example, in 2023, restrictions on the development of advanced centrifuges or on Iran's imports and exports of missiles would end. In fact, by 2030, the bulk of the restrictions would end. In other words, it was an agreement with an expiration date. Then another problem is that the deal also did not suspend the conventional ballistic missile program, a key aspect when the time came to be able to use the nuclear bomb. So, as you can see, re-implementing the agreement by itself would no longer be enough. It would have to be renegotiated almost completely, and to do so with tighter and tighter deadlines. And that is precisely why Tel Aviv is not confident. And in fact, the Israeli army is already preparing for a possible attack in case diplomacy fails. How are they preparing? Well, take a look. Israel updating plans to strike Iranian nuclear sites, Israeli Defense Minister tells Fox News. Earlier this year, Israel's chief of staff demanded an injection of nearly $1 billion for the armed forces. All this with one goal, to prepare an attack against the Iranian nuclear program by 2022, if Israel considers that Iran is moving dangerously close to the atomic bomb. Of course, this is by no means a simple task. The Ayatollah regime is quite clear about how to protect its nuclear program. First, by dispersing its nuclear facilities throughout the country. Second, by bunkering these facilities by establishing them in subterranean locations, and finally by upgrading its defensive weaponry. It is a kind of race between these two countries. The Israeli military is one of the best in the world. Its air force has a fully operational squadron of US Lockheed Martin F-35s, one of the most advanced fighters on the planet. And its arsenal boasts a wide variety of missiles, such as the supersonic and ultra-precise Israeli-made Rampage missiles, which are practically tailor-made for Iranian targets. 
Today, the greatest challenge for Israel remains the great distance to be covered to Iranian targets, a problem that would vanish if its offensive forces had access to the airspace of Saudi Arabia, the Islamic Republic of Iran's other major regional rival. And yes, while Israel's public communications may be a deterrent, it doesn't seem reasonable to think that the Israelis would let that be their only defense. But at this point, the question is over to you. Do you think that Israel will dare to launch an attack on Iran's nuclear program? Or will the diplomatic efforts being made by the Biden administration succeed? You can leave your answers down in the comments. If you found this video interesting, please give it a like and don't forget to subscribe to Visual Politic if you haven't already done so. All the best and see you next time. <laughs>